Good morning. The Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman in his very popular book called uh, Thinking Fast and Slow talks about an experiment called the Invisible Gorilla Experiment where a group of people are tasked with focusing on a particular attention requiring experiment and while they are focusing on that experiment an invisible gorilla, a gorilla walks in through the, their midst and then they are later asked, the viewers are later asked, were you able to see the gorilla at all? And the fact is, uh, people who are focusing on some particular task often forget or do not see the gorilla in the screen. You know, as pr busy practitioners in clinic, we often focus on giving our best care to the patient. And we sometimes forget the gorilla in the room, which is the cost of care. But on the contrary, while trying to focus our best attention on cost of care, we forget the gorilla in the room, which is quality of care. What I'd like to make certain is that both are not counterproductive, counterintuitive stuff, both goes together. That cost of care and quality of care are paramount. And often we may think that doing things in a very cost sensitive way may give substandard care, but that's not true, as you can see from the prior two presentations. So I'd like to talk about choosing wisely, give some broad principles uh, on advanced gastric and colorectal cancer. And please note that this is not an official recommendation. These are just my list and up for debate. A few general principles. Uh, avoid uh, prophylactic GCSF therapy in patients who are getting 5-FU-based uh, chemotherapy. Folfox is a very common <coughs> regimen. And it's not uncommon to see patients getting prophylactic pecfil gastrim in patients who are getting Farfox. Please avoid that. Patients who are getting palliative chemotherapy, let's avoid doing PET CT scan to monitor their response to the treatment. As Dr. Gupta had mentioned, there's a lot of risk for false positivity and there's really no cost benefit uh, in, in actually doing PET CT scan, no clinical benefit in doing PET CT scan with the therapeutic intention of monitoring response to palliative chemotherapy. And the general principle that we always have to focus in management of solid cancers is not to give chemotherapy in patients who have a functional status of three or four. Four is quite common. Nobody I know have given chemotherapy in patients who are with a functional status of four, but they're completely bedridden. But three is up to the eyes <laughs> of the beholder, us oncologists. We can easily categorize somebody as three or two based on how we perceive things. So if a patient is less active, less than more than 50% of the time is bed bound, I'd be very cautious and I recommend not to give chemotherapy in a palliative setting in uh, solid tumor management. When we come to choosing vital recommendations, we often focus on medical oncologists and talk only about chemotherapy. But let's not forget that radiation and that too palliative radiation is, in a, is an intense area of, uh, of choosing wisely. Let's try to focus, give, uh, in, try to avoid giving IMRT, image guided radiation techniques, to patients who need palliative chemotherapy. And again, bringing the surgeons under the gamut of choosing wisely, it's very important that the cancer surgery is curative and is quality done. Uh, we have to ensure that our surgeons implement oncological principles in doing cancer surgery. It's not uncommon when I see patients with uh, early stage uh, colon cancer coming with uh, six nodes dissected um, and uh, with not having done TME uh, for a rectal cancer surgery. So, Let's focus that the most curative approach for early stage uh, cancers are surgery and we should focus on oncological principles in cancer surgery. Another area that I see commonly mentioned is uh, DPD testing. It's uh, routinely practiced in some countries, but <laughs> at the moment, considering the cost benefit equation, I do not recommend doing DPD mutation testing in all patients uh, who are getting 5-FU-based therapy. The population prevalence of DPD mutation or uh, functional deficiency of DPD is less than 5 percentage and that do not all eventually get toxicity. So at the moment I do not think doing routine DPD testing is important in patients who are getting 5-FU based therapy. In patients who have locally advanced gastric cancer who've had surgery done even if they are node positive, currently there is no level one evidence to giving adjuvant radiation if a D2 resection has been done and margins are clear, based on the most recent analysis from the ARTIS-2 trial and the CRITICS trial. So even if patient is node positive, in node, po in node positive cancers included, there is no case for 
adjuvant radiation therapy in gastric cancer. Dr. Gupta has mentioned this. Let's focus on HER2 amplification in HER2 cancer and ga in gastric cancer. Let's avoid testing for HER2 cancer in advanced gastric cancer uh, if they have resource constraints and cannot pay for trastuzumab. Let's always remember that the HER2 targeted therapy in gastric cancer is not equal to HER2 targeted therapy in breast cancer. It's not equal. It's a revolutionary, groundbreaking, game-changing advancement in, in, in breast cancer. But in gastric, the benefits are questionable. The TOGA trial is very clear. The average overall soil benefit is hardly 2.5 months or so. And do not continue trastuzumab beyond progression in gastric cancer. Coming on to further uh, recommendations on gastric cancer, I do not think giving triplet chemotherapy, the old magic regimen, has much benefit in gastric cancer. Uh, in a metastatic setting, uh, we may get higher response rates, but keep in mind that higher response rate doesn't always translate to survival benefits. So avoid triplet benef triple chem chemotherapy, and uh, where doublet can be used, there's good trial data that suggests that doublet is sufficient in metastatic setting. And again, uh, the large meta-analysis from gastric group have suggested that anthracyclines have less benefit, uh, probably no benefit in uh, metastatic setting, and uh, probably the taxanes have replaced anthracyclines in, in early stage locally advanced as well. Resource constraints, ras raf testing, let's avoid it, especially if we are not going to do something about the implications, about the result of the test, let's not do it in colon cancer. And the whole question about using biologicals as a first-line agent in colorectal cancer, advanced colorectal cancer, let's be, uh, let's be cost sensitive and avoid using it routinely for all patients. The average survival benefits that we have seen with upfront use of bevacizumab, for instance, is in the order of about two to five months. So keep that in mind uh, before we actually use biologicals routinely in patients with uh, advanced colorectal cancer. And monotherapy with anti-VGF uh, uh, antibody has absolutely no benefit. Uh, cetuximab still has some role, but monotherapy has really no benefit. So keep that in mind. And uh, we often focus about KRAS testing. Let's not forget that a large uh, one-fifth of patients who test KRAS mutation wild type may in fact have NRAS mutation in exon 2, 3, or 4. So, um, Extended RAS testing is mandatory if you're going to consider using an anti-EGFR monoclonal antibody. And uh, in RAS mutant patients, do not use anti-EGFR monoclonal antibody because it doesn't work. No benefit, only harm. And I would also mention uh, that even if patients have right-sided tumor and are RAS wild type, I would avoid using an anti-EGFR monoclonal antibody as uh, cited by Dr. Gupta in the previous talk as well. Uh, Dr. Mukherjee has coined this term improvisational oncologist. Uh, we are all improvisational on oncologists. We try to improvise on our patient and uh, on the test that we have in our friend. But let's avoid first line use of immunotherapy. This is a question that I always get from my colleagues, my, my, from the community. Um, you know, if a patient turns out to have deficiency in the mismatch repair, should we use immunotherapy in the first line setting? Uh, at the moment, there is no data to show that upfront use of immunotherapy has benefit at the moment. So let's not be improvisational oncologists where data doesn't exist. And there's another kind of an oncology category which is called the desperational oncologist. We want to throw the best, uh, throw all of the stuff that we have uh, at uh, our patients. So let's avoid immunotherapy in patients with poor functional status. I had written a paper recently about how we actually are, uh, the survival benefit in patients with performance status of two or three with immunotherapy is dismal compared to zero or one. So PDL1 could, could be a potential biomarker, TMB could be a potential biomarker, but I think functional status as has been a marker for chemotherapy can also be applied to immunotherapy, unlike what we may hope it would turn out to be. Now, coming to the end of my talk, just two drugs, ramucirumab in colorectal cancer. There's marginal benefit as seen by several trials and there's significant cost. At the moment, I do not think that marginal benefit offsets the financial toxicity of using ramucirumab in advanced gastric cancers in combination with taxanes or as monotherapy. Now, I'd be okay with using it in combination with taxanes, but monotherapy, I'd say there is really no benefit 
Uh, we should remember that the trials that actually showed the benefit, the comparator group was best supportive care. Uh, and the last drug is regorafenib, identical problem. Regorafenib with colorectal cancer, there is a marginal benefit. I know generics are available, but at the moment, the benefit is marginal. The survival benefit, when compared against best supportive care, is still about two months or so. Now, if you were to use it, redose trials suggest that let's use an up titrating dose. Start low, 80 milligrams, and probably titrate it up. So that is if you were to use it. So a lot of things that I talked about today is what uh, we definitely should do or should not do, or maybe. So a lot of what we do in our practice, it's very <coughs> hard and very uh, difficult to make categorical statements because when we have patients sitting, sitting in front of us, we have to make decision for that patient. But let's not miss the invisible gorilla in the room, which is the cost of care. Let's not miss the invisible gorilla in the room, which is the quality of care. And sometimes, and almost always in my opinion, cost of care goes hand in hand with quality of care. Thank you.